Hello everyone. Welcome to another one of our Facebook Lives and I hope you all had a really great 4th of July. Believe it or not, even though Topeka, Kansas is flat, my house is on the highest point of Topeka. So last night I got to sit on my patio and watch all the fireworks around me. And it was, was it last night? No, the night before. Anyway, it was a spectacular night of fireworks and I hope that you all got to enjoy some of the same sort of celebration of our uh, birth date of USA. And um, so welcome. So today is a new series for the month of July. We're going to be talking about fitting. And before I get into that, I want to tell you and remind you about the July So Confident project. Last Thursday was the launch of our July project, which is the Gardenia Dress and Blouse. We, we have kits, as you know, and this is one of our fabulous kits for the dress or the blouse and you can find those on our website but I love this fabric I, I meant to put this on Erin today and we got to talking and I forgot to do it but she has on her wonderful white dress which is equally wonderful but think about signing up for either the year or by the month and if you're contemplating the year I had this happen last week someone had signed up for three of the monthly programs and wanted to know how it worked if she were to sign up for the year and of course we give you a credit for a month uh, of what, however many months you have already signed up for so the price of a yearly membership in So Confident can be something different than what is on the website if you just communicate with me we'll talk about what that would be for you so there's still time to sign up for the yearly program you get everything from last January all the way through the end of the year or of course you can sign up for the month and just simply make the gardenia dress or blouse or any of the other previous months as well. July 23rd is the launch of the video for how to make the gardenia dress or blouse, so watch for that. And then of course our Zoom Q&A is a week after that, the last week of July. All right, so today is the launch of a new product and I'm very excited about this. Some of you may be aware of the fact that we have a fashion fitting encyclopedia. And by the way, if you're interested in this new motif that we have on the printed page here, this was designed by Sarah Campbell, a textile designer in London who I adore. I first knew about Sarah Campbell because she was part of Collier and Campbell, a wonderful interior fabric company she and her sister now she is a more independent fabric designer and we first had a chance to work with her on our trip to London a couple of years ago and we did a one-day workshop with her where in one day we all produced a really nice piece of painted fabric and then she came here a year ago February and we did a week-long workshop with her so at any rate she designed this wonderful motif for us to use on various things and we have some fabric coming so watch for that some Sarah Campbell fabric but at any rate uh, we've used that for the fashion fitting encyclopedia and what this is is a boiled down version of the most common fitting issues that I have dealt with over the years in workshops in our so Kansas events out on the road emails that come to me whatever I have realized that I do over and over and over again that is in this encyclopedia and it's broken down into fitting shoulders fitting the bust fitting sleeves and fitting pants so there are I don't know there's 30 or so different techniques but I I realize that I was repeating myself a lot so now I can refer to a page number when someone calls me or emails me and we can talk about the technique right in front of us. Well, we have now put together what we're calling the Fashion Fitting Workbook and it is a companion to the encyclopedia. So this is out as of today. So what this is, is this fantastic workbook where let's say you want to raise the bust dart 
you have a page of how to do it that refers back to a page number in the encyclopedia. And you have a blank space here so that you can take the page behind it, cut out the little half scale template, and then actually practice the technique on paper first and tape it on this first page. Let me show you what that looks like. So here we have narrow the shoulders, I've cut out the front bodice piece, and then I have followed the directions and I've actually put the process on the blue page. And so it gives me an idea of how to practice this before I actually do it on a full size pattern. And there's a real understanding of what it looks like before you really dig into something for yourself. So this is the workbook launching today and we're really excited about it. So if you already have the, the encyclopedia, you may want to pick up the workbook. A lot of you already have this. We've, we've had this on our website for a while and we've sold a lot of them. But if you have this, you may still want this, or you may want both if you haven't actually invested in either one of them. So that's what's happening today. But I want to show you, we're going to take every week for Facebook Live, I'm going to do a fitting technique. And you may have seen this before. I think I did it on Facebook Live a year ago, but that's too long ago for any of us to remember. So today is talking about shoulders. And the most common alteration is how to narrow a shoulder. So I'm going to tell you how to do it. And it's on page whatever it's on, on the, in this book. There are eight different fitting shoulder techniques in the encyclopedia and the workbook. So that's a lot. But this is actually the very first one that you would do. And you determine if you need to narrow the shoulder by, of course, pin fitting the tissue on you, standing in front of the mirror, and just seeing how far it extends. Or you can do some measuring. Of course, you can measure your shoulder from a little chain of a necklace or the crease in your neck and by bending, and you come to the point where you can feel that little bone and there's a drop off. That's a measurement you can use, and you can par compare it to your, uh, the shoulder seam, the finished shoulder seam of your pattern. So either way, Sometimes when a neck is more open and you don't exactly know where it's going to sit, a garment's going to sit on you, it's a lot easier to do the pin fitting and then it's perhaps a little more accurate that way. But you start by tracing the original arm size of both the front and the back of a garment. So these black lines represent the original curve of the arm size. So I've just traced this. That's the original shape. And let's say I've determined that I want to move the shoulder in about 5 eighths of an inch. So I have a new point right here along the cutting line that is 5 eighths of an inch in from the original cutting line. So I'm going to take the tracing and I'm going to put it under the pattern. And I'm going to line up the top of the tracing with the new point, the five, eight, five eighths of an inch. And then I'm going to see if I can do this vertically. I'm usually on a table when I'm doing this. And then I take the tracing and pivot it until it is in line with the side seam. So now I can look through here and trace the original arm eye. And that is the red line. That's what represents that new tracing. So I haven't changed the circumference of the arm's eye. I haven't changed how the sleeve sets in. But I've gotten rid of this amount here that's blocked out in the red. And a lot of times, narrowing a shoulder has a lot to do with removing some excess fabric in the chest area as well, which is what this does. But I don't know about you. I find that arm eyes and sleeve heads are very difficult to draft to make go together. So we don't want to get into changing shapes or distances of sleeve heads or arm eyes, and this is the way to prevent that. So you would do it to the front, and then you would repeat it for the back, and this is your new cutting line. 
So that is narrowing shoulders. Super easy. We've just taken out all the mystery of narrowing your shoulders. You would do the opposite if you were broad shouldered. You would extend the line outward instead of coming in. But that technique is definitely something you can practice on your sheet. And you'll have that as a reference forever and you will never forget how to do it. All right, so that's our fitting. That's the fitting lesson for the first week of, Je of July and every week through July I'll be demonstrating a different fitting technique. All right, so this was um, a week of, a weekend of sewing a little bit. And we have this new kind of fabric that I hadn't really seen for a long time. And it's a waffle weave. And I've noticed that waffle weaves have come into play and ready to wear in both wovens and in knits. And we were able to get our hands on some woven versions of a, a waffle weave. And it's in cotton. So it's very, very summery and fresh feeling and very on trend as well. So I decided to make a little summer jacket. And every once in a while you need something in a restaurant or you're going to a, maybe a little event that maybe you dress up just a little bit or you just need a throw on jacket uh, when it's uh, a cool day and it's rainy and you need to have a little more, little more another layer on top of something. So I made a, a little jacket and I think it was Aaron's idea actually to use the Crossroads shirt as the pattern. Now the crossroads shirt starts out with, as this garment. And hopefully you can see that there are four segments here. I have four different fabrics. A solid linen, a little striped linen, a neutral linen, and a darker neutral linen. And there are definitely horizontal seams to this garment. One nice thing about this is that the buttonholes are part of these seams. So you don't have to make buttonholes. For those of you who are frightened of buttonholes, you might like this. And to sort of replicate that look, there are some interesting pockets in this garment that are part of this seam. So it's a very unique construction for pockets and buttonholes. The collar is also very interesting. One side of the collar is tapered to nothing here, and the other side of the collar is squared off. So there's the squared off portion, here's the tapered portion. And it has a sort of funnel shape to it, so it comes in. I think it's a really beautiful collar. Well, last year in Series 9, So Confident, we featured the Crossroads pattern. And we made some variations of it, including this wonderful pieced version, very Dolce & Cabana, you probably have seen this. It's lined, underlined, all kinds of things. It also has the cuff on it that also comes in the pattern. So the cuff is partially attached. Another unique design about this. And then we made it into a coat. This time with the collar squared off on both sides using snap, a snap up here and then buttons in those openings. Here it is lengthened, so it has the four segments and then another one added at the bottom. And another one is the fur version. I think this is so, so cute. So three versions of the Crossroads pattern. The pattern is a download pattern, and we explain how to do all three of the versions and work with the uh, Crossroads in this compendium. Now, of course, you can buy, still buy series 10, or excuse me, nine of So Confident. That's always available. But if you're interested in just the Crossroads, you can down, purchase and download the pattern and or get this compendium which explains all three of these variations. But just know that this was the starting point for what became 
the little jacket. So this is very much like the fur version, but just in the waffle weave. So I first combined the pattern pieces. So I combined these three segments and literally used this as my bottom hem. So I just deleted the pocket and deleted the bottom panel. I didn't do the cuffs, so the cuffs are just hemmed in a simple way, and in this case, rolled up. And I had decided originally to do the collar as a squared off collar. I had the garment all made and realized I didn't like the collar the way the waffle weave stood up in the front. And so I took the garment apart, not completely, but took the facings off, took the collar off, and recut it. And now I have both ends tapered, and I like it a lot better. But this collar is interesting because it is normally six pieces. It normally has one side that is tapered and the other side is squared off. And there's normally a seam at the back of the collar right there. I know you can't see that, but there's a seam right there. There's a seam here. So it's segmented. So I taped them all together using the tapered end. And then I cut the collar down so it was not quite as high. And I put it on the fold. Get myself oriented here. There we go. So I put it on the fold. And there we go. Cut it like this. So I had a one-piece collar. So much easier to deal with. And I was able to get the shape, and it worked just fine. Still had that funnel shape to it. But when you're working with a fabric such as this, you don't want to have a lot of seams and a lot of detail. Because there's a certain loftiness to this fabric. And I thought that the seams were getting pretty thick. When I put the two-layered fabric between the garment and the facing, there's some bulk here. And so I decided to reduce the bulk around the collar and make it one piece. So it's easy to do. So working with this fabric, I realized it's simple to sew. It just sew, goes through your sewing machine just fine. But there is this lofty aspect to it. And I threw the, the fabric in the washing machine, and the texture popped out just a little bit more, which I really liked. Plus, it softened it just a little bit, which I also really like. But it didn't change the character of it enough to really alter it. It's still a waffle weave, and it's a very, the weave is not going away by any means. I did use some ultra sheer interfacing for the front facings. I did not interface the collar. I decided I wanted to leave that a little bit soft. And I think I probably made the right decision. Uh, I can't tell the difference, really. Where there were some bulky seams, I used my long quilting pins, my quilting pins, which I have here someplace, which are now gone. Well, they're gone. But the longer quilting pins, they have glass heads, and they're just longer, and they're very flexible. And I liked those better than my normal glass head silk pins. I did engage my even feed feature on my sewing machine, or you need a walking foot, because there's, you know, there's, some, there's some heft there in thickness. And so the, fab, the um, machine's going to guide through the fabric a lot easier if you're going to engage that. Now, I found that if I pressed it too hard, I, I saw a little bit of change of texture and so particularly at the collar and on the seams you want a light press and you want maybe just a hand press you don't want to really really get that iron down on this fabric or it will alter the character of the waffle weave at the neckline i did do some under stitching that was a way to keep that facing to the inside and make that a nice flat seam otherwise that's pretty heavy right there my seams, I, I toyed with the idea of surging the edges and pressing the seams open. And then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to try it with sewing the seam and surging the two raw edges together and pressing the seam one direction, and it worked just fine. I did decide to keep the whole look 
very clean. And so I did not do any top stitching on the hems. This is the kind of work that I actually like to do when I'm in front of the television watching The Last of Homeland. I'm finally finished so I can relax a little bit and go to bed a little bit earlier. Uh, but I did some hand stitching for the hems of the bottom of the garment plus the bottom of the sleeves. I've talked to you about the collar. So now the garment is done-ish. So I'm asking my Facebook friends to tell me whether I need buttons and buttonholes, snaps, or nothing. So put it in the chat what you think I should do. I'm sort of liking it without anything. Of course, if I knew how to cover snaps, I would cover snaps in pink fabric, and I would probably do that. But I don't know how to do that very well. So I don't know. And the snaps that we have are darker. We have, we have some great snaps. We have antique, um, antique brass and silver and a gunmetal. We do have a white one, but it's a little bit bigger. So I'm sort of, in fact, I think that I have a, yeah, I have a sample of the white snap that we have. We really have great looking snaps. So this would be perfect if it were smaller, but it's not smaller, it's bigger. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence about finishing it. I toyed with the idea of just doing the button, buttons and buttonholes last night to show you, but then I thought, no, it might be kind of fun to see what the consensus of, of, of you all say. So tell me what you think. Now, uh, in addition to the jacket, I made an ET out of a similar color of cotton knit. Now the ET just happens to be my favorite t-shirt, particularly for wearing under something. It has some shape to it, so there's not a lot of bulk. It has just the right length of sleeve to cover my arms, but I mostly love the hemline of the, of the ET, that it's curved, shaped, and I just, I love this, I love this tee. And of course I used my cover stitch machine, my new cover stitch, to cover stitch the neckline and the hems. And you know, after about 25 t-shirts, I'm pretty comfortable with it. I still have to take a breath before I do the cover stitching, but all it is is practice. As you know, I take uh, some watercolor classes online and some other art classes online, and yesterday I was taking one from a gentleman on, on um, ink drawing, and he says that he has practiced for one year on drawing a straight line. And I thought, well, that's just about what I've done to practice these necklines. For the last year, I've been practicing cover stitching, and it just takes practice. So we're all pretty hard on ourselves when we don't do it right the first time. It just takes practice, and sewing is practice, just like everything else. So I like the tonal look a lot, because I'm seeing that in Ready to Wear. So the next piece I'm going to make are the pants. And I didn't get those done. You can probably relate to that as well. So I'm going to make Hudson pants, which is what I have on today, in our viscose linen. Now this is one of our most popular colors, this very pale blush pink. We have a little bit of it, and we have a whole lot more coming in, but it's just not here yet. I'm expecting it in August. So if you're interested in this color, you're just going to have to wait. But I love the idea of tonal changes of texture from very smooth cotton knit to slightly rumpled viscose linen to a waffle weave jacket, and I think that's really a beautiful combination. So, all right, so I want to show you what fabrics we have in the waffle weave. I think we have five colors. We have the blush pink, we have silver gray, we have charcoal gray, mustard, and blue. Now I noticed when I was looking in this, at, through the uh, iPhone today in getting ready for Facebook Live that this looked fairly gray, but this is pretty blue in, in reality. And this is definitely silver gray. 
So I tried to find some coordinating knits that you could use with them. So this is a cotton knit. I better check that. It might be viscose. It's rayon. It's not cotton at all. It's rayon bamboo. So this is a viscose rayon knit. And that, to me, is a tonal uh, good companion with this waffle weave. By the way, I could not tell the difference in right or wrong sides of the waffle weave. So then, uh, for the mustard, we didn't have an exact match, but we have a nice, nice yellow that I think is a nice coordinate with it. A little bit lighter, but it would be really pretty with it. And then for the charcoal, we have a heather gray. A little bit lighter, but it definitely in person has a nice heather uh, effect to it. The yellow is viscose. The gray is viscose, rayon. Then we have the light gray, also rayon. And this is heathered as well. The way it's rolled, the right the wrong side is out, but I'm sure you can't see the difference. There's not much difference between the two, actually. And then this is organic cotton. I guess the pink blush is the only cotton one that I have on the wall. So I love this whole kind of tonal thing. And you know, there's a lot of crossover here. You know, I love the idea of the mustard with the gray. I love the idea with charcoal and blue. So, you know, you can mix this up. Put this pink with the gray, either any of the grays, any of the blues. So even though I like the tonal idea, there's uh, all kinds of mixing and matching that can happen there. So that's about the fabric. Now, one of the things I forgot to tell you about when I was talking about fitting is that I have a certain number of tools that I work with. And I don't know why I forgot to tell you all about that, but I did. So here we go. So the first thing I have is the kind of pattern paper that I use. And this is exam, exam paper. You can buy this by the roll on places like Amazon, or you can buy it at places that rent crutches and sell wheelchairs and all that sort of thing, a medical supply house, which is where we get ours. And we buy it by the case. But I think you could probably buy it less than a case. Is that true, Erin, or not? Yeah, I think you can go into those kinds of places locally and buy a roll of this. It's smoother on one side than the other. It has a little bit of a gritty side on one side and smooth on the other. But I just love this paper, and I like it better than uh, the more fabric-like pattern paper. I like this because I can see through it. I can tape it and it'll stay with some of those bonded kinds of fabrics that are pat sold as pattern uh, materials. You can't use tape on them, but I'm constantly changing what I'm doing, and so I need to be able to take the tape on and off. And so the tape that I use is a removable tape, and it comes with a blue ring and a blue label. So check that out. This is fabulous because it tapes down the tissue, but you can get this off without tearing the tissue. And it's the only tape that I have found that does that. The pencil that I use for making new marks, unlike what I showed you with Magic Marker there on that drawing, is a very specific red pencil. It's by Prismacolor. It's called Call Erase, C-O-L dash Erase. It is carmine red, and it has an eraser. I've added an eraser because you can see I use the eraser a lot. I want to be able to erase the lines. If I'm making a number of adjustments, let's say on my shoulders, there's an order that you do things, narrow shoulders being first, and then sloping shoulders or rotated shoulders in some way. I might want to erase the previous lines because I'm doing something in addition. So I like to be able, and plus I make mistakes, so you know, this pencil is, is my friend. I don't use ballpoint pens, I don't use magic markers, I don't use pencil pencils, I like red pencils. Then I use, if I'm going to buy one, well, I don't know, it's sort of a toss-up actually. Everybody has to have a straight ruler. And I use a 2 inch by 18 inch see-through ruler that has an eighth inch grid on it. I like the flexibility of this ruler. I don't like heavy, thick rulers. This is a personal choice. But I like the flexibility of this ruler. I also have gotten used to a hip curve that's clear. Now, you can buy these in metal, 
I had a metal one when I was in college, but I've gotten used to being able to see through this, and I really like to see where I am on my pattern in reference to other lines. So I prefer the clear ones. And we have hip curves, we sell these. But of all the curves, this is the one I use all the time. Not just for hips, but for blending lines of all kinds. These curves just seem to work more often than not. I also use a French curve, just a regular French curve. Nothing fancy, not even particularly made for the sewing industry. You can buy this in architectural drafting stores and, and places like that. And then, of course, what would we do without our curve runner, where we're measuring necklines, measuring arm size, and comparing uh, distances on patterns. So this has become a really solidly used tool around here, for sure. Erin and I use this all the time, and I don't know how, how I ever got along without this. I used to use a tape measure and stand it on its edge and march it around curves, but this makes it so much easier. This will measure 12 inches, and of course, if you keep track, it'll measure more than that once you've passed 12. So check this out. Okay, I'm glad I remembered to tell you about tools, that's for sure. All right. Um, I think that's it. Any questions? Yes. Um, could you put on the jacket? Yes. <laughs> By the way, I have on the swing tee. Well, that takes care of another question. <laughs> <laughs> that is the split swing tee, which was, I think, series eight of So Confident. Yes. Yeah. I still have little threads on it, I see. So there I am. There we go. And what is the weight of the waffle? The weight is just really lightweight. I don't know the actual weight. I don't know how to translate that to you in terms of ounces or whatever, but it's very lightweight. These bolts that we have on the on the wall back here are very large, and I was able to get them up there. You know, you can just tell the weight of a fabric. Unlike linen, which is very heavy, certain other fabrics are very heavy, like viscose jerseys are very heavy, but this is a very lightweight fabric. Is it like a shirt weight or a jacket weight? Like, would you make a shirt out of it, or you think it's more? I think it's more jacket weight. It could be a certain kind of shirt, a simple shirt, but I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just, when I saw the fabric, it said jacket to me. Mm -hmm. So it's light, but it's lightweight, but it's, but it's lofty. Mm -hmm. There's there's a spongingness to it. Right. Yeah. Can you compare the waffle cotton to corduroy? Oh, it's not even close to that. It's not as heavy as corduroy. It doesn't have a nap like corduroy. Uh, it probably reacts like corduroy in terms of drape. I would say it's not a super heavy drapey fabric, which is why you want something that has a little more shape to it. I think if you tried to make something super large and super boxy, it would be pretty overwhelming. So something that has some shape to it, I think is a little bit better. And so if a pattern has a drop shoulder, can I assume you can't narrow to a regular fitted shoulder? Or can you? On the crossroads, you can narrow this shoulder if you choose to, to a regular fit. Yeah, I like drop shoulders, um, but you can, you can definitely, this isn't that much of a drop, actually. So you could? Yeah, you could narrow this shoulder. Narrow that. So how mm -hmm. much would you narrow it as far as, like, how much is too much? Oh, more than an inch would be too much, probably. OK. Um, does the fitting workbook and fitting encyclopedia, does it have a forward shoulder adjustment? Yes, the uh, encyclopedia and the workbook has a forward shoulder adjustment. Okay, so she has almost an inch forward shoulder, so a little adjustment won't do. So she I think yep. wanted to know how to do it. All right, so it has narrow adjustment, broad, narrow shoulder, broad shoulder, sloping shoulder, forward thrust shoulder, Balanced shoulder, extended shoulder. There's two more than that, actually. Balanced shoulder, extended shoulder, forward thrust, 
rounded back, sloping shoulder, narrow shoulder, broad shoulder. There you go. Okay, so it does have broad shoulder. Yeah. That was one of the questions. Yes. Um, what about large biceps? That is in here. Uh, that is under fitting sleeves and it's arm girth adjustments and it's both in the encyclopedia and the workbook. Whatever is in the encyclopedia has a page in the workbook. There are a couple of things in the workbook that are not in here. Uh, one being uh, broad back. There's another one and I can't remember what it is. <laughs> the pants fitting section has a chapter for adjusting a protruding tummy. What about um, adjusting a protruding tummy on tops and blouses? No, there's no um, adjustment on um, per se for a tummy adjustment on a top or a blouse. That's, that's all. You might want to consider taking my fitting solo class for Craftsy where it talks about taking all the measurements and adjusting a simple top. That would be, there's not a, to my knowledge, a specific tummy adjustment for a top. That's all about just general circumference adjustment, not tummy per se. Do you have tips on the sequence of the adjustments? Is that in the, is that in the yes. book? Yes, the sequence is exactly how it's listed. Narrow, broad, sloping, forward, thrust, balance, and extended. Yeah, there's a definite order and starting with narrow or broad. And some people need all of them. So that's why this pencil is handy because you've made one adjustment and you have some red lines and then you're doing another adjustment and you get to erase some lines and do something else to it. You just keep building on the first adjustment. Um, if you're gonna make the crossroads out of the piece or if you're gonna do the different panels, do you, how much yardage do you think that would be for, like if you were gonna use four different fabrics? Um, well, each of these segments is about, um, get my handy dandy <laughs> ruler out here. It's hard to do um, live. So a quarter of a yard, quarter of a yard, quarter of a yard, half a yard, plus sleeves, mm -hmm. that'd be another two thirds of a yard. So something like mm -hmm. that. Maybe if it was 60 inches if wide. It, if it was 60 inches wide. Mm -hmm. So many more fabrics are 60 inches wide now than you see. I'm hot. <laughs> more. Yeah, we don't we have, have the to air turn on. the air conditioner off because mm -hmm. of noise while we're doing this. So. Is the waffle weave knit or woven? The waffle weave is a, a woven. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the reviews on the snaps versus buttons versus nothing has kind of been all over. Um, a lot of different opinions. So I don't know that there's been one I'll have to, one read, I'll have to read your comments <laughs> and take a poll. <laughs> Lots of some, I've seen lots of good as is, like just leave it. Let's see. So that's the comments that I'm filtering through right now. Um, oh, they did want to see the, um, the waffle up close. Okay. <clears throat> see the back of the linen crossroads. Okay. It's the same as the front. Four different fabrics in this case. Now it doesn't have to be in four different fabrics, you know. I just mm -hmm. pulled this one out of the archives because it hopefully showed how the seams can be worked with. I've made my share of short ones. I've made my share of just a contrasting yoke with a solid fabric below. You can play around with the number of, of different fabrics. It doesn't have to be four different fabrics. So there's a flexibility to this that's kind of fun. Um, if you don't have a cover stitch machine, is, uh, what would you recommend? If you don't have a cover stitch machine, then I say this is stitched with a single stitch uh, about mm, 
a good eighth of an inch from the well of the seam and top stitch the hems in a normal way with a straight stitch. I don't use twin needles, a lot of people do. I just can't stand them. I think they create a tunnel. I think they look horrible on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the waffle weave will be too warm for Phoenix summers? Uh, outdoors, for sure. <laughs> uh, indoors, it'd be nice. <laughs> and air conditioning is brutal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure a jacket of any kind in Phoenix in July would work in any fabric, but uh, unless it's a open weave, something or other that air can get through. <laughs> um, and it's a 100% cotton. It's 100% cotton. Okay. Um, can you? They want to see the blush and gray waffles together. <clears throat> All right, so here is this gray with it. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. I think that looks nice. And there's this gray. I don't know which one. Yeah, I think I like the lighter one myself. Yeah. The blue and yeah, the Yeah, these are similar nice. value. Mm-hmm, true. Yeah. Could you use the waffle weave on the Chicago jacket? Oh, that'd make a great chi Chicago jacket. Mm -hmm. Yep, sure would. It'd make a great Tremont, Chicago. Um, Stafford. Um, a Liberty shirt as a jacket. A now jacket, a Zen jacket. I wouldn't do it for a pearl. I wouldn't I would do it for an opal. Not I would not do it for an Anne's. I wouldn't do it for a garment that requires some drape. But something that has structure, like the Chicago is perfect. Uh, would you mix the waffle cotton and linen together on a crossroads? So would you oh, that would be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could get um, some nice contrast in texture. That'd be nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What size is the waffle jacket that you made? Extra small. I purposely wanted it to be um, a small little jacket, I'll call it. Um, in a shirt, I would make a small. Would you use the waffle weave for a Hudson top? No. I would not use the waffle weave for a Hudson top. Too much volume, not enough drape. Did you mention the, uh, the Quincy? Would you I, did, I would make a great Quincy. And what, how would the zipper work? Do you think that would work out okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could you mix two waffle weaves for a marceau top? No. I think the marceau is better in a knit. And the sleeve, I don't think that would look good. It'd be kind of a... Oh. No. The answer is no. <laughs> no. Uh, is forward... I think we're, she's referring to forward shoulder, different than forward thrust? No, forward thrust and forward shoulder are the same thing, where you start at the same point at your neck and you're pivoting forward. That's forward thrust or forward shoulder. That's what I have to do to a pattern, because my shoulders are coming forward, unfortunately. So your narrow shoulder adjustment was 5 eighths. I find that patterns often are well over one inch in the shoulders for me. Would you use the same method as the book for narrowing larger yes. shoulders? Yes, no matter what the distance is, the same method works. Whether it's a quarter of an inch, inch, inch and a quarter, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think this is referring to how you mentioned you would do, start with narrow shoulder and you would continue down the line if you had other adjustments. Um, but so she says, so the subs subsequent adjustment overrides the previous one. Well, it's an addition too. So you do the narrow shoulder 
and then you do the sloping shoulder on the adjustment that you've made with the narrow shoulder. And then you've made the sloping shoulder, so then you do the forward thrust one after you've done the first two. So that it doesn't over, if I'm understanding this right, they don't override, you don't do one instead of the other, you do all of them in that order. Can you show the pretty jacket with different fabrics shown in the beginning? I wonder if you already did that. <laughs> I'm not sure, oh, maybe it's that one, okay. Yes, so confident jacket. Yeah. This is an awesome jacket. Mm -hmm. Samantha Plo and Kathy Davis combined their artistic talents to make this jacket. Would the waffle weave work for travel? I think it would work for travel really well. Um, it's cotton, and so cotton wrinkles, but there's something about this fabric that seems to recover from that. I had this jacket in my, the trunk of my car this morning with things on top of it. So I think it'd make a great uh, jacket. I toyed with the idea of adding a pocket, which would be nice for travel. For sure, in the inseam pocket, I, I, the reason I did not put a pocket on top, like a patch pocket, was I was worried about that loftiness and it feeling kind of thick, but an, an inseam pocket would be nice. So I think for travel it would be great. Mm -hmm. I think it would also be nice lined. It would, it would slip on a little bit easier, and you know, whenever you line something or underline something, then it helps it to reduce whatever wrinkling properties it might have. But does it feel okay without it being lined? It does. It, 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 it's not hanging on, hanging up on, on the knit that I have on. But I, I could sort of imagine that it would feel even better if it were lined. Um, would you do a chateau or a high five? Or I, I mean, would you do either one of those in a oh, waffle? I would do a chateau or a high five. Yeah. Did it shrink when you it washed it? It did shrink, and I can't tell you how much. I didn't. I failed to um, measure it exactly, but I have this sense that it shrunk. And the reason I know that is because I didn't have enough fabric. <laughs> so, but it shrunk a, b a bunch. I mean, I'm going to say if you if you're thinking about it, you'd need to have maybe another quarter of a yard. Think about that, getting some extra. Uh, it may, let's see, um, it's 57 wide. To me, that's 60 inches. So, but yes, I ran a little short of fabric. Do you do the bust adjustments before the shoulder adjustments? Um, shoulders are first, bust is second. Can we see the back of the pink jacket? Back of the pink jacket? Mm -hmm. Get her all nicely mm -hmm. situated. Okay. Um, the lighter gray waffle, is it called stone? Oh, looks like yes. Betsy answered Stone. that. Stone. Mm -hmm. Yes. What fabric would you use to line the jacket? I would use Bemberg Rayon, our traditional lining, or China Silk, something pretty traditional. China Silk would be lighter. Bemberg Rayon is easier to come by. We have a lot of linings on our website. We don't have our China Silks on the website, I don't believe, but our Bemberg Rayons are. And I think just a traditional lining would be great. I wouldn't use another cotton. I think you, that doesn't do anything. Uh, any silk, you know, get in your stash and get out some silk that you meant to make a blouse out of 25 years ago and <laughs> use it for lining. Silk crepe de chine, charmeuse, those kinds of silks. Not silk noil, not habitai, not raw silks, but a nice, smooth 
satiny silk. I, I'm, I don't use acetates for linings. I don't use nylons for linings. I'm, you know, Bemberg rayon is sort of the gold standard of lining, and you just can't beat it. We do have uh, one last request for you to put it on again and turn so they can see the back of it on you. Um, and I think after that, you can just go over what's on sale. Okay. So you can see that she just taped all those pattern pieces together and created just one front piece, yep. one back piece. I was just referring to a question. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, looks good. Yeah. All right, what's on sale? All right, so, sale day. Let's talk about that. So all the fabrics that I've shown here, I think there are 10 of them, are on sale, 15% off the waffle weaves and the solid knits, the crossroads sh shirt pattern and the ET patterns are on sale. The compendium is on sale. It's already a bargain. And because so many people, I'm funny about this, I hate it when a lot of people have purchased something and then it goes on sale. So this workbook or excuse me, encyclopedia, is not on sale. But the workbook is 25% off. So grab both if you don't have both, or grab this if you already have this. And with every order of a, an encyclopedia or a workbook, you'll get my favorite little 5 8 inch wide clear ruler. That'll be in your package at no charge. And I think that's it. Is that everything on sale? Let's see here. I think so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, next week is fitting something. I've forgotten the order. Bust, I think. Not sure. Anyway, stay tuned and um, we'll see you next week. <laughs>